Hey everybody, welcome to session 2.4. You're all going to be so excited to see how short this recording is. It is a very short class session. It's because usually it takes a while to get through sessions 2.1 and 2.2, plus the material we're covering here for this session is just shorter in nature. We're going to be talking about tax forms, federal tax forms specifically. I want you to be able to First of all, know the economic cost of tax compliance for nonprofit organizations. I'm going to talk in a minute about what tax compliance is and what the costs of it are. But then after that, we're going to talk about the 1023 and the 990. The 1023 is the form you file to obtain tax exempt status. The 990 is your annual tax return as a nonprofit. Okay, let's talk about tax compliance economics. When we talk about the cost of tax compliance, we don't talk about the taxes that are owed to the federal government. We talk about the cost of just filing your tax forms and not the check you write to the federal government if you owe a tax, but the amount of time you have to put into preparing your taxes, the work and effort that goes into documenting and and, uh, retaining documents, the amount of money you might spend on an accounting firm to help you prepare your tax filing or a lawyer to help you manage a specific tax issue. Essentially complying with the tax law costs a lot more money just than, than just whatever you pay in taxes. There's money that's on top of that. And w- one study found that 501c3 organizations annually spend about a, almost a billion and a half dollars on federal tax compliance. Now, Think about this for a minute. That means that collectively this space, this industry, spends well over a billion dollars so that they don't pay taxes. They don't owe federal income tax, and yet here they're spending over a billion dollars as an industry just to file their tax forms. And, and it's obvious why now, because of the time we've spent on this so far, is because taxes are complicated for nonprofits, even though they're tax-exempt. It's the, it's the rules of exemption that are complicated, and that's why it costs a lot of money. In fact, the federal government gives up about $31 billion by not taxing the nonprofit industry. That's $31 billion in tax revenue they would be collecting if they were charging a tax on nonprofits. But they don't, so that's money that goes away. It's interesting to compare that number with, of $31 billion of given up revenue with the number that relates to the compliance costs associated with tax exemption. So um, so if you look at how expensive this is, nonprofits pay $1.37 billion a year to comply with tax with the tax code. That's about half a percent of total nonprofit revenue every year. It's about 1.6% of contributions. So put another way, every dollar that you give to charity, one and a half percent of it, or one and a half pennies of it, goes to an accountant to help them file their taxes. And then I mentioned that the federal government gives up about $31 billion by not taxing nonprofits. That means the compliance cost is about 4.4% of that, what's called a tax expenditure. Not, Not taxing something is sort of like spending money on that thing. And here, the tax compliance cost of $1.37 billion is about 4.5% of the tax expenditure. And so that's quite a bit. I mean, this is, you know, these look like not huge numbers or percentages, but none of you spend half a percent of your total income just to file your taxes every year. And so in perspective, that's actually a pretty high compliance cost. And the IRS has tried to simplify this as far as the law has allowed them to, but in other ways, it's actually become more complex over time. We'll talk about a couple of examples of that in a minute. But, uh, but this is not a cheap process, filing your taxes every year as a nonprofit. This is one of the reasons I discourage people from starting nonprofits and that's, unless they're really sure that's what they want to do. Okay, let's talk about Form 1023. This is the form you file to obtain tax exempt status. So if you do it right, you only file it once. One of the interesting things, if you think about it, is if you set up your nonprofit under state law, so you incorporate in the state of Utah as a nonprofit, you're probably not ready to file your your, your 1023 on that same day. It's probably going to take a little while to prepare your 1023 while you're engaging in your operations. And you can't file your 1023 before the organization exists. And so what the IRS has done is create a, a rule that allows um, your tax exempt status, once you get it, to be retroactive. So as long as you file 
uh, for, sorry, for the, from the day you file, if you get tax exemption, it's retroactive as far as 27 months in the past. So essentially, if you start your nonprofit on day one, you can file two years and three months later still. And then if you get your status, it's still retroactive all the way back to day one, which is pretty, which is a pretty good deal. So, um, filing a 1023 is quite a bit of work. Um, my experience in preparing them for clients is that usually it would take three to four weeks of work, not just exclusively by the lawyer account preparing the form, but by the, the staff members who, you know, are collecting the information. There's a lot of sort of back and forth. It takes a while. And by the time you filed it, there's a form you file that's, you know, 13 pages long. And then there are also the attachments you have to include. And so it's not uncommon to have a stack of papers a half an inch tall that you're sending into the IRS to obtain your tax exempt status. One other thing to note about this is that this is a public document. Um, what that means is anybody off the street can walk into your headquarters of your nonprofit and say, hey, I would like to see a copy of your 1023. And by law, you're required to provide it. Um, the funny thing is a lot of small nonprofits, when they first apply for their exempt status, they send the only copy of the 1023 that they have off to the IRS. Well, you're not going to get it back. And so make sure you have copies of this form before you file it. The IRS has created something called the 1023-EZ, uh, and this is intended to be a simpler form for small nonprofits. It's filed electronically, meaning you don't file it on paper. To qualify, you have to be an organization that projects or can, or at this time makes less than $50,000 a year and has a total of less than $250,000 in assets. But it is not available as a form for churches, hospitals, schools, supporting organizations, or nonprofits engaged in joint ventures. If you're doing any of these activities, you have to file the regular 1023. But what's nice about it is it's cheaper and shorter. The, ten, the regular 1023 costs about $850 to file, and like I said, is a pretty, stall tack of, pretty tall stack of paper. The 1023EZ is only $400, so it's slightly less than half the cost, and and uh, it's just four pages long. And so if you qualify for the 1023EZ, it's the better form to file. By the way, those uh, financial limits in the second bullet, those only apply to the first three years of operation. If you're going to be bigger than that after three years, then you can still get away with filing the 1023EZ. Okay, let's talk about the 990. So the 990 is your annual form. This is like the 1040 that people file to pay their taxes. The 990 is the f form that nonprofits file to not pay their taxes. And you qualify for filing this form. Uh, you file this, or sorry, everybody files this form. All nonprofits file this form every year, unless they're a church, which we've talked about already in class, that churches don't have to file a 990, or they make less than $50,000 a year in revenue. Um, if you are one of those with making less than $50,000 a year in revenue, you file what's called a 990N, uh, which is just, they call it a postcard filing, but it's done online. Um, and it basically just tells the IRS that you still exist. Um, you have to file these every year. If you don't file every year at the end of your third year without filing, then a computer at the IRS will revoke your tax exempt status. It just automatically revokes you. That used to not be the law, and um, when it became law, a bunch of nonprofits that were not in compliance went three years without filing their 990s, and they lost their tax exempt status. In fact, about 10%, a little over 10% of nonprofits in the United States lost their status automatically when this law went into effect. I want to talk about something else, though. When you file your taxes, the IRS has three years to do something about it if they disagree with you. This is what's called a statute of limitations. When you file, you've basically given evidence to the IRS that says, hey, this is what these are our tax obligations for this year. And the IRS is given three years to challenge it, to say, hey, you said it was this, and we disagree. If they don't come within three years to challenge what you said in your tax filing, then they're out of luck. They're kicked out of court because the statute of limitations has run. Um, but if you never file, it never starts the clock. And that means the IRS can always come back to you in any year that you don't file. And this is why it's so important to file your taxes every year. Because if you do file, it starts this three-year clock running. 
And so the IRS has three years to respond. If you fail to file in a given year, then the IRS is always entitled to come back and challenge you. So make sure you file. The 990 is also public. Uh, well, the last three years, the previous three years of filings are public. If you want to avoid making something public and you don't have to put it in your 990, then don't put it in your 990 because um, this is a document that people get to see. So in class together, we're going to sort of, I'm going to pull up a screen with an example of a 1023 and an example of a 990. So you guys have a chance to explore the forms a little bit. And you're going to see evidence of things we've talked about, like the organizational tests and the operational tests and, and uh, ways that they look for excess benefit transactions and stuff like that. And that is session 2.4. See you all in class.